Hello, my name is Alex Wiseman. I'm Associate Professor and Coordinator of the Comparative and International Education Program in the College of Education at Lehigh University. There are many different things that have brought me to this program and uh, into this field. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how, how I came into the field of Comparative and International Education. It's a, it's a unique path for all of us, I think, in, in one way or the other, how we end up doing what we, what we end up doing. Uh, mine actually started in the classroom. I started out as a classroom teacher teaching English in Japanese middle schools and then also teaching in American high schools. I began uh, working in Kamioka, Japan as part of the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program right out of my teacher education program uh, uh, a while ago. And uh, then I moved on after that to teaching English at Aztec High School and, and sometimes coaching basketball there uh, for a couple of years. And the thing that I found most interesting about both of those experiences was uh, the way that students interacted with the community outside of school or after school. How they actually used their school experience and hopefully the knowledge and skills that they gained as part of that experience to enter the labor force or to move on in some way. I became particularly interested in why students went to school, why education was seen as such an important institution, and how students moved from the world of school to the world of work, how that transition took place. And that led me to think more comparatively about education. What is it that we do in the United States versus what is it that happens in other parts of the world, and how can we think about shaping that educational experience? Uh, I ended up going on for uh, two different graduate programs in comparative and international education, one at Stanford University and the other at Penn State University. And what I, what I found most interesting about uh, each of those uh, experiences, both as a, a teacher and then as a, a student studying uh, about what happens in school phenomena, was that there are really four different elements of the field of comparative and international education that, that I could be a part of. One was the idea of contextualization. Um, at the time when I went to Japan to teach, Japan was seen as a model of education. Uh, America was, was looking at the Japanese school system as something that we should emulate, some uh, uh, ways that we could learn from what the Japanese experience was. And one of the unique things that I had as, as a, one of my responsibilities while, while a teacher there was that I actually I was a, a liaison or a, a, a an escort to visiting teachers from the United States who would come into the Japanese public schools. They would observe what was going on and they would literally uh, write down notes and take that back to their home district in the U.S. with the intent of, of moving those policies and practices right into the classrooms there. And what struck me and what uh, many people have discussed in the literature and elsewhere is that there's really a, a contextualization to what happens in school. Yes, there are some, some common elements of schooling, especially mass public schooling that we can see from nation to nation, but understanding what the history of education in a particular community is, what the background of perhaps the students and teachers are, the way that schooling is viewed and developed in a particular system or culture or community or society, all of those are important elements when we compare education systems. And I was struck by the um, often wholesale borrowing or copying that went on between the Japanese and the American system uh, during that whole experience. So one of the things that we talk about in comparative and international education is how can we contextualize our understanding of schooling in different uh, systems. So how do we understand or how do we compare so that we're not looking at apples and oranges but, but looking more at apples to apples or oranges to oranges, although I know that that's a silly analogy, but thinking about what are the common elements that can actually be compared in the first place. Another important element to uh, the field of comparative education that, that sort of comes out of my background there is the idea of collaboration. How can we actually work together as scholars and as policymakers to think about what we need to be doing in schools or how we can understand the phenomena of schooling? Uh, what is it about education that is interesting across nations or between nations? So working together, whether it be with other uh, scholars who are doing research in the area and using our uh, different abilities and theoretical approaches to collaborate, or collaborating with representatives from ministries of education or multilateral organizations or NGOs or you name the organization that influences education at the international level. 
those are very important elements to comparative education and some of the elements that, that we at Lehigh University find particularly salient. We also have to think very carefully about communication in our field. What is it we're actually communicating? What are the results of what we're doing? Um, I personally work a lot with internationally comparative tests of math and science, such as TIMS, the Trends in International Math and Science Study, that is uh, organized by the International Association for the Evaluation of Educational Achievement, or the IEA for short, and the PISA study, Program in International Student Assessment, that's, that's uh, coming out of the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And one of the things I find most interesting about the results that come out of these large-scale cross-national studies is the simple fact that policymakers often seem to be presented with rankings, literal rankings of country by country, how students in that country did perform raw score-wise on these tests of math and science. And often the rankings are seen as being the predominant um, result that comes out of these studies. Now, there are those who disagree with me, but there are a lot of us who think that just looking at the rankings is an inappropriate way to communicate the results of these sorts of tests. For example, the example I gave about American teachers coming to Japan. One of the re reasons they were doing that was because as a result of the second international math study and the second international science study, Japan scored quite highly. In fact, the average score for students in Japan was at the top of the list, top of the rankings. And so Americans and other countries were looking at the Japanese as a model. But again, not really contextualizing what was going on. Not really thinking about what are all the different historical and, and situational elements that go into understanding why Japanese students perform at the level they do. And thinking more importantly, how is just raw academic achievement, raw performance on this test, how is that really contributing to society, uh, to political development, to economic development? Can there be a direct relationship between raw scores on a test and uh, uh, income earning potential afterwards? These are important questions to consider. And so when we communicate the results of comparative education studies, we have to think about not only are we communicating accurately what's going on, but also how are policymakers going to interpret the information that we're providing. Um, we don't want it just to be reduced to a, an executive summary with bullet points or some sound bites or, as I've, I've already criticized, just a raw ranking. We want it to be understood in terms of what actually are the um, forces, what are the influences, what are the different sorts of elements that contribute to making an education system what it is. Another element that we think about in comparative and international education is the element of community. And this is, a, in many ways, an identity crisis that we might be having, right? Who are we? What are we trying to do? Who are the people that make up the profession? And can we say that we have professionalized? A couple of the elements of that, in a study that I've recently been working on, looking at professionalization in comparative education, are where are our uh, centers of expert training? Do we have control over what is considered expert knowledge in comparative and international education? And the answers, I think, are, well, interesting, maybe a little disconcerting. There is no standard model for creating and training comparative education specialists. There are many different models. And in fact, I personally think one of the strengths of our field is that we come out of many different disciplinary traditions. I myself would align more closely with sociology, um, looking at sociological theory and methodology as one of the fundamental ways that I think about comparative education. Um, I have colleagues, in fact, Yvette Solova, my colleague here at Lehigh University in our Comparative and International Education program, comes out of a, a different tradition, more of a political science and historical background. And she uses theoretical and methodological approaches that are unique and, and quite frankly, very appropriate for those fields. Um, so when we look at comparative education as a whole, we see that there are many different ways to train people in comparative education. One of the things that we try to do in our program here, and that, uh, that I think about quite a bit, is how do we bring these dis different disciplinary foci together into, under one umbrella and talk about comparative education? How do we complement one another in terms of our disciplinary backgrounds and traditions? How do we actually um, uh, think collaboratively about understanding the phenomena that make education systems what they are around the world, and how does this actually have real impact 
for what's going on in classrooms and schools. Not that we're actually training people to work in schools because that really isn't one of the, the things that we do. We train people and we work with people to understand how to influence policy, how to, how to conduct research and appropriate data analysis so that those who are responsible for making decisions related to schools will have appropriate evidence to back up those decisions. And then we think also about um, where is a base of knowledge that we can all refer to. Sometimes this is referred to as a canon. Is there a canon for knowledge in comparative and international education? And like I mentioned, the study that I've recently been working on uses some public data out there related to what sorts of uh, things are being taught and readings are being offered in introductory comparative education courses around the world. And we actually can see that there is an emerging uh, canon, so to speak, mostly a canon uh, comprised of edited works that bring together multiple perspectives, uh, which I think is interesting and quite appropriate for our field. We also have to think about who is our community? Uh, who are the other people that we're talking to? Um, how do we actually affiliate with one another? So I've already mentioned that, that um, there are a lot of different, there, there's a lot of diversity in who is a comparative and international education specialist or works in comparative education. We have people working in organizations like the World Bank who would call themselves comparative educators. We have people working in um, places like uh, Save the Children who would call themselves comparative educators. We obviously have a cadre of us who work in academia who will call ourselves comparative educators. How do we actually come together as a community is a fundamental question that, that I think about and I ask. And one of the things that we have thought very um, closely about at Lehigh in our comparative and international education program is how we can bridge policy and practice together. I've already mentioned that I myself come out of a classroom background and I tend to think about how a teacher would interpret the information that I'm either studying or trying to disseminate first and foremost and then I work on how would this be interpreted for policy reasons. But we also try to bridge that over to real policy making, real decision making that would happen at the school or at the regional district or at the national level or even at the transnational level. And that's an important element to consider. So, one of the ways that I personally have tried to uh, think about this and incorporate these different ideas of contextualization, collaboration, community, and uh, communication is uh, through a volume series that I have co-edited for several years and now I, I'm the series editor. It's the International Perspectives on Education and Society volume series. It's published by Emerald Publishing out of the UK. It's one of the few volumes that's actually peer-reviewed, so we go through quite a rigorous process of, of having peers in, the, in our field look at each of the chapters and, and make comments, and, and sometimes we can't include everything that we'd like to uh, because of the, the rigor of our standards. But one of the, the main foci of the volume series is actually doing an annual review of the state of the field of comparative and international education. What are the big issues? What are the theoretical approaches? Who's talking about what? And so we've had a couple of different volumes in the, the recent past that have really tried to hone in on one issue in particular, provide a range of perspectives on that from people not only in academia but also working in these multilateral agencies and organizations that I mentioned, NGOs, etc. Starting with uh, uh, one of the earlier volumes that I worked on was simply was titled um, uh, global trends in educational policy and we were trying to look at the different ways that education policy was being shaped by various understandings of education systems around the world both specific to uh, individual nations sometimes looking only at a couple of nations and also looking cross nationally across many nations at once for global trends one of the more recent volumes that we did dealt with at the uh, um, UNESCO education for all so we looked at how is EFA, or Education for All, providing sort of a global promise, but encountering some national challenges. So the idea that we would have Education for All uh, school-aged children, that it would be public or government-sponsored, that, that there would be equal access, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status. I mean, these are all good ideas that I think we would all probably agree with on one level. But how is that actually being addressed within particular nations or within particular education systems? So how do we bridge, again, policy and practice is something that we focused on. 
So those are just some of the challenges that uh, we see in comparative education. Some of the uh, things that I have become more interested in as a result of my own background and experience as a classroom teacher first and foremost. And I'm excited about the future of the field and the direction that's headed. And I think that we have a lot to offer in uh, our program here in comparative international education at Lehigh University.